Okay, we're going to begin in this um, legal research and writing lecture on chapter 8, which is legal citation form. Um, I'm going to split this lecture up into two parts for this chapter because there's an awful lot to go over. Now, I'm not sure whether you have what's called a blue book citation book. You don't need it for this chapter. But understand that in the future, if you do decide to work for a law firm, you are going to need that blue book so that you can um, appropriately cite whatever it is you are citing. Okay, now let's just start with what in the world is a citation? Um, this is different from, a little bit different from, your English class where you had um, a bibliography with citations from where you got information, okay? In, in law, we do that same idea of giving credit for somebody else's work, but we do it in a specific, um, in a specific format, okay? So when you write, you're not allowed to take credit for other people's work. It's called plagiarism. It's why people get upset about it, because it's not your unique idea. Now, some people will say there are no unique ideas in the history of the world. Okay, you know, we can start splitting hairs. But when we're talking about the law, it's really important to know where um, a concept or a principle in the law originates, where you're getting your authority. Now we've been talking about authority. What, what does that really mean? Well, look, the world is not governed by the law according to Diane. I wish it were. In my house, sometimes it is. But the law according to Diane is worthless. Who am I? Right? We need to know who has authority to say this is what the law is. So when we recognize a court or a statute, and those are our primary authorities, remember, when we recognize that there is some principle in law, there is some decision that gives us precedent in the law, well, we have to give credit to whoever it was who came up with that principle, whoever came up with that precedent, because it certainly isn't the law according to me. Because if it is the law according to me, who cares? Right? And knowing where a principle comes from, or where a statute comes from, or where an idea in a case comes from, gives that idea some credibility so that you can rely upon it. It becomes persuasive. If I come to you and say, well, the Supreme Court says, fill in the blank, well, then it's not the law according to me, it's the law according to the Supreme Court. And in our judicial system, that wins. That's persuasive. That gets applied to whatever the factual situation at hand is. Or if I say the law says and I give you a statute, a law that's been passed by Congress on the federal side or by the state of Ohio, if it's a state issue. Okay, it's not the law according to Diane, it's a law according to the legislature, which in our system has authority to write laws. And so knowing how to tell the reader, hey, this is where I got this from, is important. And this is where I got this from is a citation. It's telling the reader, don't believe me. This isn't the law according to Diane. This is the law according to this particular case. Or this is the law according to this particular statute. <clears throat> Excuse me. So that's what a citation is. 
it is lending credibility to whatever argument it is you are making. It is lending credibility so that you are more persuasive in convincing the court to rule the way you think the case should go. Um, and it prevents you, with a good citation, from being accused of plagiarism. <clears throat> Excuse me. Because, by the way, if you're a lawyer and you plagiarize, you can be sanctioned. Your license can be at issue. You're not allowed to take somebody else's idea and say it's mine. And again, why would anybody want to do that? Because the law, according to me, ain't much. So it's always much more persuasive to put in place the correct citation so that whoever's reading it, a judge, opposing counsel, can say, hmm, I came from the Supreme Court. That's kind of persuasive. Now, other side, what do you got to counter it? Okay, so the citation is where you can find whatever statute, principle of law, holding of a case, reasoning of a case that you have put into whatever document it is you filed with the court so that the other side can say, yeah, that's where it came from. The other purpose of a citation is so that you stay honest. Now, not just honest in, hey, this is somebody else's idea, but that you stay honest in saying, look, this Supreme Court said X, Y, and Z. Here's the citation. Keeping you honest so that you don't stretch too far in saying that actually the Supreme Court said X, Y, and Z. There are a lot of lawyers who will stretch what a court says because in stretching, then you can sort of get the court to come along with your position. Um, you know, sometimes that's considered good lawyering, but sometimes that's considered fibbing. So if I get a pleading, if I get a motion from a lawyer and there's all these citations, I'm going to check that what that lawyer says that case stands for, he's not stretching too far or he's not misleading the court. I can, because of the citation, go look up that particular case or go look up that particular statute. So I can check the other lawyer's work. And let's say that the lawyer says, the Supreme Court says X, Y, Z. And maybe the Supreme Court said X and Y, but didn't stay Z. When I file something with the court, I'm gonna say, hey judge, opposing counsel says that this particular case stands for the principle of X, Y, and Z. He's misleading the court, okay? I could say she's misleading the court too, sorry, not that woke. They, I'm not gonna say they because that's bad grammar. So the lawyer is misleading the court. And sometimes lawyers do that. And lots of times it's not intentional, it's just again, this stretching of what you think the court's position is or decision is or holding is, stretching it to sort of wrap it around what your facts are so that you can say, well, wait a second, this really does apply to my case. If you have a good citation, and you have to have a good citation, by the way, for everything, um, the opposing counsel can pull that case. And when I say pull that case, that means I'm going to go on Westlaw, and I'm going to type in the citation, and I'm going to read the case. Okay? Pulling the case, you know, kind of goes back to the old days when I used to have Arnold Schwarzenegger arms, and I used to have to go to the library and pull 
the reporter off of the shelf and open it and read it. Now you just pull it off of Westlaw. Okay? So once I see a citation, I'm going to go blah, 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 and I'm going to read the case. And by the way, my computer makes that noise when I do that. Blah, 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 blah. Um, I'm going to read the case. And I am going to see if what opposing counsel has put in their motion as what this case stands for, what the holding of the case, what the ruling of the case was. I'm going to make sure, right? Because if they stretched it, then I have something that I can write about in my response motion. Okay? So the two purposes of citation, one, give credit where credit's due. Not my idea, and if it were my idea, who cares? <clears throat> Excuse me. And by the way, I'm going to double check that that is actually what that case or that statute says. It is to provide consistency, credibility within whatever document it is you're filing with the court. Okay? Now, there are two different manuals that tell you how to do citations properly. One is called the Blue Book and one is called the ALWD. Um, your book goes through some other citation manuals but those are the two biggies. Now, ALWD stands for American Associ uh, Association of Legal Writing uh, Directors. Uh, we don't bother with it. You know why? Because nobody else bothers with it. Blue Book is actually what everybody uses, okay? So that is the manual that has the correct citation formatting for everything under the sun. However, in this chapter, it's kind of condensed into one chapter of this book. That's one reason why I really love this, this textbook, okay? So... Um, you know, there's a history of Blue Book. Blue Book was put together in the 1920s by Harvard and Columbia and Pennsylvania and Yale. And what they did is they took the way every little state did their citation format. And they put it in one book. That's really it. It's just a compilation of how we do citations. Okay? Um, now... Your book goes through in section C of this chapter, chapter 8, legal citation form, the organization of the blue book. If you don't have the blue book, again, it's not that big a deal. But I am going to spend a second going through all of the different sections of the blue book because, again, in the future, you may be working for someone doing citation checks or writing, legal research and writing, and you'll need to know the organization. The first is the preface, don't even bother with it, and the introduction, don't really care. Then we get to the meat and potatoes, which is the blue pages, the general rules of citation and style, the tables, and the index. Blue pages are really helpful because it gives examples of different states, and how they do their citations as well as federal. Then in the general rules of citation, it gives you not just primary authorities, but also gives you periodicals and constitutions and statutes. And so it's much more in depth. And then really what I use all the time are the tables and index. If I have a question on how to do a citation, and I want to double check because honestly on Westlaw they'll give you how to do the citation but it's not always right. I not, don't mean to make you paranoid but it's not always right and you need to have some place that you can double check. I'll either go to the tables or to the indexes. For certain things and we're going to get into that in the chapter the tables especially are really really helpful. Okay so that's how the blue book is organized. Okay, now on section D of your chapter, it gives you specific examples of how to do 
um, your citation for primary authority. So remember, primary authority is the case itself, not an encyclopedia that talks about the case, not an article or an attorney general opinion that talks about the case, the case itself. Okay? So a citation is divided up into four major parts. The first is the case name. The second is where to find the case. The third is in parentheses, the county, the district, the circuit, uh, the court of appeals, where that case was decided and the year. And then in some cases, um, what happens to that case on appeal, okay? So it's the name of the case, where to find the case, right? I call it the mailing address. Um, in parentheses, the year and the specifics of the, the court that decided the case. And then for some cases, what happened to that case on appeal, okay? So let's start with the case name. Okay, there are examples in your book of the correct and incorrect ways to cite cases. If we're talking about the names of individuals who sued themselves, who sued, sued each other, not themselves. Let's say it's Diane Hetson versus Sue Smith. When I'm doing a citation, I'm trying to shorten as much as I can, abbreviate as much as I can. Why? Well, if I'm reading along and I have to read this four line citation, I forget what I was reading. So we want to condense as much as possible. When in doubt, shorten is the rule. Okay? So if it's Diane Hetson versus Sue Smith, my first name's really not that important. Sue's first name's not that important becomes Hetson v. Smith. Last names only, okay? Um, we're not going to put, you know, if, if, if it were um, Sam Smith the third, I'm still just gonna put Smith. Or if it were Sam Smith Jr., I'm still just gonna put Smith. The purpose of the name in the citation is just to give the reader enough information so that they can go look it up, okay? And again, we're not just relying on the names of the litigants, we're going to give the mailing address too. So <clears throat> if we're dealing with, say, a company, but the company is a name, we're still just going to use the last name. You know, a lot of people are incorporated or have an LLC and it's just their name, comma, LLC or their name, Inc. And that's because they're trying to protect themselves from liability. We still don't need all of that, except we are going to keep the Inc or the LLC because that's different from just the individual. So if it were Diane Hetson, versus Sam Smith, Inc. It's just going to be Hetson v. Smith, comma, Inc. Okay? What if I'm suing a company that's got multiple names? You know, law firms have lots of names. Jones Day, Peavis and Rogue, right? I think that's right. <clears throat> I don't have to name everybody. I just have to give the first name. So if it's Diane Hetson versus Dewey, Cheatham, and Howe, my favorite name for a law firm, I'm just going to put Hetson versus Dewey. Cheatham and Howe, when you pull up the case, you'll be like, oh, the name of the law firm is Dewey, Cheatham, and Howe. Yeah, it's very funny. So, you know, you only have to put the first name. Okay? If I am 
suing lots of people. I only put the name of the first person. And just as a little aside, um, lots of times when lawyers sue multiple people, they'll put the biggest name first because that's the name that's going to make the paper. So let's say I'm suing an anesthesiologist, um, a surgeon, and the Cleveland Clinic because something went wrong in a surgery. Whose name do you think is going to go first? Cleveland Clinic, right? So that hits the papers and it's a bit more splashy. Just a little inside baseball for you. Okay, but in the citation, it's just going to be Hetson v. Cleveland Clinic. Everybody else, when I open up the case, when I pull the case, is going to be like, oh, they sued like 14 people. Okay, but I only needed one to find it. And that's the whole point of the citation. Okay? Um, if I am suing... Um, well, your book goes through destructive... Uh, if I am suing um, as the United States... Or if I am suing a state, I am not going to abbreviate United States and I am not going to abbreviate um, the state. Okay? So if I am uh, United States versus Souther, it's going to be... Um, United States versus Souther. It's not going to be United States of America versus Souther. It's not going to be USA versus Souther. It's not going to be US versus Souther. United States. Keep it clean. Okay? If I am suing, if I am the state and I am bringing a criminal action against someone, um, I am not going to put state of Virginia versus, and I am not going to put Virginia versus, I'm just going to put state versus whomever. Now, I know that's really confusing. We do criminal cases just a smidge different um, than um, civil cases, but when the state is bringing a criminal action against an individual or a corporation or whomever, it's just state versus, not state of Ohio, not Ohio versus, state versus, okay? Um, and if it's, a, if it's a, an action that is not my state, let's say it's state of Pennsylvania bringing an action, it's a little different again. I'm just going to put Pennsylvania versus somebody. And again, that is telling the reader, okay, I'm practicing in Ohio, but I'm going to cite a Pennsylvania case. It's not a state of Ohio case. It's a Pennsylvania case. And it gives the reader a head up, heads up, that this is not really law that I have to pay attention to, but that, that I wanted to draw your attention to for whatever reason. Okay? If it is a city, um, you are going to put city of whatever. Um, why is that? Mm, don't really know. It's just to confuse you, quite frankly. Okay? Now, abbreviations of words are a big part of of citation. This is where the tables in the blue book really help you because there are three tables that just lay out abbreviations. So if you're like, oh, should I abbreviate that word? Should I not abbreviate that word? You look in the table and it tells you. Okay? And there are some in my book on page 294. This is still uh, section D of um, chapter 8. And we're going to use an ampersand, Association, Brothers, Company, Corporation, Incorporated, Limited, and Number. Those are our typical abbreviations, okay? Um, 
And so if I am, you know, Hetson and Sun and Ink, um, that and in the citation is going to become an ampersand. Okay? Or if it is Hetson Corporation, well, I'm not going to write out corporation. I'm going to abbreviate it uh, C-O-R-P. Okay? So in Westlaw, when you do a citation, it'll give you those abbreviations. Um, but it's important to know where to find them outside of Westlaw. Okay? All right. Those are our ways to write the names of the cases. Um, your chapter goes through parallel citations. Parallel citations are where you're using an authority that's not the primary authority. What does that mean? That means I can find the same case in a West reporter as I can find in Ohio State reporter. Ohio State reporter is the primary authority, but I can give you a parallel citation in a West authority. Okay? Which means I'm basically giving you two citations for the same thing, which is why they're parallel. Okay? Now, I'm going to give you the real world, the real rule, and the one that they tell you in law school. In law school, no parallel citations. In the real world, remember, citations are a courtesy to the court and a courtesy to opposing counsel. They help everybody find the case. Almost everybody has Westlaw. It's easier to find cases in West. Give a parallel citation. Done. Okay? Now, West reporters um, have their own regional uh, citation. Remember, for West, the country is divided up into Northwest, Northeast, South. California has its own. Uh, you know, Northwest, Northeast, I, I mean, um, North, Northwest, Southeast, or Southwest, you get it. There are all these reporters out there, but they're all regional. So if you see a citation that's got, you know, Northwest, Southwest, Pacific, those are West reporters, and that's a parallel citation. You want to have the primary citation, which is sanctioned by the state, or sanctioned by the US Supreme Court and then in addition to that you can have a parallel citation okay and that's typically going to be a West reporter okay now your book gives you um, a list of all of the district courts and circuit courts in the federal system we're going to take a second just to review, again, what courts hear what kinds of cases. Why are you doing that, Diane? Well, because remember, we've got three, sometimes four parts to every citation. The name of the case and where the case was decided. Where the case was decided is going to tell the reader what reporter it was reported in. Remember, we have state cases and federal cases. Let's start with the federal cases. District court cases, those are the trial courts in the federal system. Circuit Court of Appeals cases, that is the Court of Appeals in the federal system. And then the U.S. Supreme Court. Okay, if I have a district court decision, the reporter is going to be federal supplement. If I have a circuit court decision, it is going to be reported in federal reporter. And if I have a U.S. Supreme Court decision, it's going to be in U.S. Supreme Court reports. Okay? So if I look at the citation and I see the name of the case and I see that it is a federal reporter, where I can find this case, I already know 
This is a circuit court of appeals decision in the federal court system. If I see a citation and the reporter where the citation says for me to pull the case is federal supplement, I know that that's a district court decision, trial court decision. And if I see U.S. in the citation, I know that's a U.S. Supreme Court decision. Okay? The citation itself will give a hint to the reader where this case came from. All right? And those are the federal cases. Those are the reporters we're going to find the federal decisions in. Court of Appeals, I'm, I'm sorry, the, the District Court, Circuit Court of Appeals, and Supreme Court. Okay? How do we abbreviate those? Because remember, we're trying to smush when we do this citation. The federal supplement is abbreviated F period, SUPP period. Federal reporter is F period. And U.S. Supreme Court decisions, U.S., U period, S period. Okay? See how we squished it? Here's the confusing part, get ready. The publishers of Federal Supplement, Federal Reports, U.S. Reporter, after a while, they're like, wow, there's a lot of cases here. We're going to start the second series of this. And then after second series, there were a bunch of cases. They're like, eh, time for third. And after they got a bunch of cases in third, better have a fourth. And so you're going to have not only the name of the reporter, the abbreviation for the reporter, but also some kind of designation about which series of this reporter we're supposed to look in. And that can make a difference, right? Because if I'm looking in the 50th volume, page 470 of Federal Reports second series, and I should be looking in the fourth series, I'm not going to get the right case. So it's important to know which series you're looking in. And those are simply abbreviated by 2D, 3D, it's not 4D, I think it's 4T or 4th, okay, um, series. And you're not going to write series out, you're just going to put the number. Okay? So remember, when you're doing your citation and you're abbreviating the reporter where you find the case, that's important. Now, what else goes with the name of the reporter, right? Because, okay, it's in Federal Reporter 3rd Series. Woohoo! 17,000 cases I got to look through. I'm going to give the volume number of the book where you can find it and the page number that the case begins on. So if it's the 50th volume of Federal Reports, third series, page 470 is the case that the is the page that the case begins on. I'm going to put 50 F period. I think I said three, right? Third, three D. 470. That's the mailing address. It's the volume number and the page and then the name of the reporter. That's the second part of your citation. Okay? Your book gives you abbreviations and gives you um, a breakdown of all the district courts and where they are. Why is that important? Well... Remember I told you there's the third part to all of our citations that goes in parentheses? We have to identify, unless it's the U.S. Supreme Court, because there's only one of those, which district court the case was decided in, or which circuit court of appeals the case was decided in, and the year it was decided. Okay? So if the case was decided in the Sixth Circuit Court of Appeals. I'm going to look at my little printout here um, on my, in my book on page 306 and 307. I'm going to look up Sixth Circuit. 
I'm going to see that's in Ohio. And I'm going to put sixth, number six, TH, circuit, abbreviated CIR. Remember, we were trying to keep things short. CIR period. And then the year it was decided, say 2022, in parentheses. That's giving the reader tons of information, right? That's giving the reader the information of the names of the litigants, the volume, the reporter, and the page number in that reporter where you can find the case. And just to be clear, if I open up the case and it's not a Sixth Circuit Court of Appeals decision from 2022, I don't have the right case. So it's a multitude of information in a very short little compact sentence that tells the reader a ton of information so that they can go pull the case. Make sure you're not stretching it. Make sure that the citation's right. Um, just make sure that everybody's playing above boards. Okay? All right, I'm gonna stop right there. We're going to pick up with state citations because remember these are just federal citations that I've gone over because states are a little different. Okay? So our next lecture will be on states. Please look and see the discussion because I'm going to give you um, an assignment on Westlaw and an assignment in the textbook um, for your next lecture. Okay? If you have any questions, please email me as always, and we'll try and get together either on Zoom, or um, or we can I can email you an answer. Okay, thank you.